Good afternoon, welcome. My name is Olivier Schwab, I'm Managing Director at the Forum. Today's session, Family Business, Relic or Role Model. Uh, we know that a large amount of the world's assets are in the hands of family businesses who, by definition, have to take a long-term view so that they can keep their enterprises fit to pass them on to the next generation. So how do these, what kind of special model of stakeholder capitalism can we learn from family businesses? What are some of the challenges which they face? This is what we are about to explore. Uh, Linda Gratton is going to uh, lead the session. Linda. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to start actually by asking how many people in the room are from a family business? Hands up. Yeah, I thought we were probably talking to the choir here. <laughs> uh, that's wonderful. Um, I'm Linda Gratton. I'm a professor at the London Business School. Uh, my actual, my research is in multinationals, not specifically in family firms. But a couple of years ago, I began to become involved in family firms in, 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 through the WEF. And what I began to see is that it is an extraordinary model, an extraordinary model both in terms of intergenerational uh, succession, uh, in, in terms of the way one thinks about the future, and indeed in some ways of balancing the values that a, a family business creates with the values that society needs. So this session today is a wonderful opportunity for us to hear both from those in family businesses and indeed in the case of Stan, uh, from a CEO who's managing what was a large family business. Just what that means and also what <coughs> corporations can learn from that. So may I first of all introduce our panel to you. I'm going to actually start with, with and then I'm going to ask each person to say a little bit, uh, something, but let me introduce the panel first and then I'll come back and we'll, we'll do that differently. Um, first of all, uh, may, may I introduce Stanley Bergman, who's the chairman of the board and CEO of the Henry Schein uh, organization in, in the US. And um, stands here because occasionally in the, in the history of family firms, um, professional managers come in, and Stan is, is such a person. Um, he actually took the organization uh, from family ownership into public ownership, and he perhaps will say a little bit about that in a moment. But uh, let me secondly introduce Camila Hagen-Sorley, who is a member of the board of the Konica family uh, firm of Norway, and in fact is also a young global leader. So uh, welcome to this panel. And finally, uh, let me introduce Andre Hoffman, uh, who as well as running what looks like an amazing wine business, by the way, for those of you, I, I thought I'd say it before he does. Um, also uh, is uh, the uh, vice chairman of, of Roche. Uh, so uh, we have an amazing uh, group in terms of, of, of the panel. I, um, I wanted actually to start with Camilla and I wanted you, know, to, you to say something about how do you see a family firm, particularly in terms of intergenerational succession? How, how does that work in your view? Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I want to start with a quote for, from one of my uh, favorite po poets. You might call him a slam poet. His name is Mike Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> Every, everybody's got a plan until they are punched in the face. And investing with a long-term perspective makes it a little bit more difficult to be punched by short-term corrections. Ah. And one of the strengths of family businesses is the investing with a long-term perspective. Um, I would say that historically also family businesses uh, have been in many ways taken on a kind of stakeholder capitalism. Mm. Because to be able to develop and sustain a company for the next generation, which perhaps has been the biggest purpose of a family company, you have to also invest in the society around you. You have to invest in your employees. Uh, you have to, to invest in teams. You have to invest in, in your family and uh, the communities. Uh, and of course, you have to invest in the future. Um, so being a uh, next generation and the second generation of a, a family company, 
I am, of course, a product of my generation. And uh, what we see today is that you cannot be, you cannot create, um, uh, you, you have to create value in a way that also is positive for society, for people and planet. Uh, and I want to say, as we heard Professor Colin Meyer early, earlier today, the purpose of a company is to produce solutions to problems of people and planet and in the process to produce uh, profits. Mm. Thank you so much, Camilla. And I, I guess right from the beginning of this panel, we've already identified three issues which I think we're going to come back to. One is, how is it that family firms have this extraordinary capacity to invest into the, in the long term? <laughs> is there anything that other types of companies could learn from that? Secondly, um, working across stakeholders is a really important part of many family firms. And thirdly, as each generation steps up, the, the challenges they face are unique to their time in, in, in the world. Um, and are they therefore more able, perhaps, than other, other organisational forms to be able to understand those, those issues? So, Camila, thank you so much for that wonderful beginning. Stan, um, you're... Well, well, everybody here is a professional manager and a professional leader, of course, but that's specifically your role. Would you, would you like to comment on how you see family firms and also perhaps how they change over time? Sure. Um, so, my company, Henry Schein, is today a Fortune 500 company, started uh, 88 years ago. Uh, 29 years ago, and this is all public information, filing through the SEC, there was a family dispute. Three wings of the family. So, a couple of the family members said, sell the business, and we came up with an alternative proposal, which is let's take the company public, give management a five-year chance to do that. If it doesn't work, um, we'll sell the business. If it works, the family members can liquidate their shares um, as they will. So we've been public for 25 years. One set of the family have kept every single share. One set got out um, mm. 20 years ago. And one set is a hybrid. So in my view, whether it's public or private, I don't think it really matters. What matters is the values. And if a company has good values, it doesn't really matter. And so we at Henry Schein believe in our five constituents that make up what we call the Henry Schein mosaic of success. On the one side, there are people that either manufacture products for us in our own firm or we buy them from other people. We want our people that provide us with products to really be successful through us. On the other side is our million and a half dentists and physicians that we service around the world. We want to help them operate a more efficient practice so they can provide great clinical care. In the middle is our team, and we are committed to team values extraordinarily, and you can read about it. Uh, uh, there's a Harvard ca case study on that. Trust me, uh, for the moment, uh, we don't have much time. We are really committed to the team. And the other side, the fourth, is our investors. And we have been clear since our IPO that our investors are important. They're entitled to a good rate of return but the company does not exist for the investors. They're one of the five most important constituents of the company. And the fifth constituency is society. We work with all the professions that we service. We're involved in the communities, in the professional associations. We're involved in the communities we're in, but we're also involved in communities around the world that we may not even have financial interest. And our focus is access to care, access to oral care, dental care, and medical care. So I would submit that it doesn't really matter. Mm. What counts is, at the end of the day, the results. And I believe that if you only focus on the short term, you have problems. Yeah. And if you fo focus only on the long term, you also have problems. So I think even in a private company, you have to balance those two. Sorry, can I just ask you a very straightforward question before we move on to Andre? Um, you called them... When Henry Schein started the company, were those his values? Those were his values, but we expressed them 25 years ago in a formal mission. Yeah. And it's not a mission that's just hung up. It's actually practiced. And uh, 19 years ago, we have codified our social responsibility by founding what's called Henry Schein Cares, which is active, very active in healthcare mm. and emergency response. Uh, 
Thank you so much. I mean, again, some really fantastic issues, I think, which we'll want to explore. One is the question about disputes. Um, family firms have disputes. Every so sort of organisational structure has disputes. How do you, how do you work through those? Um, secondly, the question of values. And, and I ask that question because I think it's a really interesting question. Where do values come from? Uh, and part of what makes a family firm, if it's successful, it's often to do with the, the, the values that were created by the founding members and how those values have both um, been created over time, but also how does each generation reinterpret them? Can really your point, really? How do you, as your generation, reinterpret those values? Andre, you have been very much involved it within the World Economic Forum uh, in terms of how families within the WEF, family firms work together. What's, what's your view about what's, what makes a family firm unique? And would you agree with Stan's view that actually it really doesn't matter what the ownership structure is? What matters is values, but then also results. Well, <clears throat> um, hello, everybody. There's lots of questions in the last one. I will yeah. try to sort of take them in turn. Um, I, I, first of all, when I read the title of the session, you know, our family business uh, a relic or, or are they a model? Um, I think we could say both. I mean, there are a little bit of a leftover of the previous, or the previous uh, uh, times, but they are also behaving in ways which uh, uh, deserve, to deserve attention, and perhaps we can spend some time spending about this. <coughs> when, I, when I was, um, um, but first of all, a couple of words about the company. Uh, we are going, next year we're going to be 125 years old. Uh, w m my generation, and some of them are with us today, uh, is the fourth generation. Um, we, we've recently, uh, um, and that's been published uh, a month ago, transferred some of our shares to the fifth generation. So we, we really are involved into this process of succession. Um, but we, have a cap we are quoted in the stock exchange. We are, we are a hybrid mechanism. Um, we have um, uh, a quotation on the, on the Swiss stock exchange um, uh, and the, fam the, the, the two types of securities are, are listed on the stock exchange. One is a dividend certificate, one is a voting right. So with 9% of the paper published, and, um, sorry, with only 9% of the totality of the capital quoted on the stock exchange, we have the majority of the vote. And that gives us this rather complex structure where we are publicly quoted and we are under the scrutiny of the markets and you have thousands of analysts who look at our numbers every second. And then you have um, um, a, a stable majority, which uh, is a family owned mm. and, and, and continues to discuss. <coughs> when we have a conversation, when we have a governance issue, we apply what I call the pyramidal model or the triangular model. Um, you have a conversation between the management, represented by the CEO, who is a member of our board. You have the board, which is constituted from international business people and scientists, um, represented by its chair, and the owner. And the three of them together have a dialogue which, we, which allows us to react quickly and which allows us to think long term. And maybe, we, again, we can come back to that. So my family very kindly uh, elected me as being the family representative, which means I'm the vice chairman of the board, and we, we have the, this dialogue in that context. So why do I tell you that? I tell you that because there is a combination there of stability and agility, which is very important. So, if I, so, so um, when I uh, came of age and went to um, a, a business school, uh, not the London Business School, but another very good uh, school called INSEAD. And if some people are, want some details about INSEAD, come and see me after. Um, it's a wonderful school. <laughs> Yeah. We, 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 um, uh, I was told quite clearly, this was in 1990, I was told quite clearly, look, uh, go, stop it, this is not right, uh, step aside. The family control is an obsolete notion. Uh -huh. What you really need to do is to increase shareholder value. And the only way to do that is to employ some MBAs, preferably trained at INSEAD, <laughs> who, 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 will, uh, who will increase shareholder value, who will just focus the whole management to make the share more expensive. And now we get into this logic which I think is failing us, and that's where I think um, family businesses are model, is that uh, you don't run a company just for short-term profit maximization. If you want to be successful, you think a little bit further than the next decision. Uh, if you, the only criteria that you use is uh, the, the, the one that's going to give you the most cash the most quickly, you're not going to be able to run this company for very long. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're an MBA from INSEAD because you're going to retire four years later anyway. And, and if possible, at the share price at the maximum, which means that your options are going to give you lots of money. 
But if you happen to be an owner, if you happen to think about these shares are going to go to, my, to, to the next generation, you think a little bit more before taking this sort of decision. And I think that's, in, in that respect, family businesses uh, model. Now, we could also uh, open this conversation to what does it mean to create value? How do we measure value? How do we, uh, how do we in the long term, decide what success looks like for a company? Uh, in the pharmaceutical business, we have cycles of at least 15 years from the discovery of the molecule to, to the end of the, of, the, of the marketing process. It, it's quite difficult to think in quarterly sales sort of volume. It it's just, just doesn't work, just doesn't equate. So it's, um, um, uh, uh, other companies uh, have the same... Um, have the same promise, but we solve it differently. Maybe I'd stop there for a minute. Can I ask a very specific question about that? I mean, when we talk, many of the family firms that, that are part of, the family businesses that are part of the WEF have been uh, there for many generations, two or three generations. Um, when we look at companies being built now, so if, for example, we look at uh, California and we look at the tech companies that are being built now, it doesn't look to me as if any of those are necessarily going to be family businesses. Why is that? Why do you think that Google or Amazon or Microsoft are not family businesses? Andre? Can I, maybe just, <laughs> first of all, I'm not at all sure that's true because the founders, even when they go away, leave themselves the right to decide. Mm. And that for me would be quite a characteristic of the family business. Do, but do you think <coughs> that actually when your companies were built, it was a time when building a family business was part of how an entrepreneur would have seen their legacy. Camille, I mean, what, what, how do you see that? Yes, maybe, um, maybe you have, have a point there. Uh, I, um, I do believe that, um, uh, uh, like this is also an aspect of the, the era uh, that, that, we, that we live in. Uh, and um, looking back where, um, uh, where, for example, in our uh, situation where my father actually uh, built a company and uh, started his first grocery store together with his father. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the company being built on family values uh, in that perspective, of course, that is something that they carried on to, to the next generation. And, um, uh, and growing up today in a more kind of professional setting uh, where we did not uh, create the companies in the same way um, that might yeah, create a different aspect of this. How many people here are building a business now which they think they will hand on to their next generation? I don't mean those of you who have inherited a business. I mean those of you who are building it as an, as an entrepreneur. Is anybody here building a business that they think they're going to hand on to the next generation? A couple of people are. See, that's sort of an interesting... Can I, can I just give another yeah. point on that? Because yeah. I, I mean, I do believe, and I guess also with the companies that you mentioned in America, it's just uh, the structure is different and the family of the ones creating them, they will be exposed to foundations or some other kind of, of wealth or uh, what we really inherit is a responsibility. Yeah. So, uh, it's a uh, responsibility yeah. to create yeah. value for the whole of society yeah. uh, and, and to make sure that your company or, or the values of the companies uh, are sustainable and, and, and are continuing living. So. Can I, can I just one yeah. thing? I don't think any entrepreneur sets up a company just in order to be able to sell it. Selling it is a, is a, is a, is a rupture. It's a painful exercise. It's a, you, you, you do have to go to the stock exchange at some stage because you need liquidity, but it's not the intention. The, the, the purpose of the company is not to make money only. The purpose is to serve the community, and you will do it better if you stay in control. And would, does that also mean, though, that you would pass it on to your family? Well, the, the, the succession issue is a different issue. This is something you, you, you organize for. This is something you, you, you planify for. But um, the startup who starts a business by saying, this is going to be 20 million in a year, it's going to be 150 million, yeah. it's going to be 200 million, and let's sell it, and let's start something else again. Frankly, I think that's very painful. I don't, I don't know many people who do that because they want to. They might have to. Stand. So I think we have to bifurcate the world a bit. The tax regime in the United States doesn't really allow for family businesses. In Europe, you, in Germany, I don't know, in Scandinavia, but you have in Switzerland, you have companies that are, in Germany, 200-year family companies. The US, because of estate taxes, it's very difficult. So you can give, a founder can give a lot of shares to a foundation, but then you also have to cede the control. 
if you don't cede the control, it is very, very complex. So I think that's one of the reasons why in the US you do, you, it is, it's very hard to move to the second generation. It's possible, but very difficult. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to come back to an issue that we sort of started to talk about, which was intergenerational, particularly in terms of values. I mean, Stan, yours is an interesting company because you said earlier it, it doesn't really matter what the ownership structure is, but at the same time, your values are the values of your founder. How is it that over time yeah. you've kept those values burning? I was going to say something, but I'm <laughs> glad you asked that question. In my view, values have to remain constant, but the culture has to change. I always tell our team, when I joined the company in 1980, I put in the first fax machine. The culture today has to be very different, but the values can remain constant. So the culture has to change. And by the way, the biggest change is when I joined the company 40, almost 40 years ago, uh, you didn't have to make decisions that quickly. You have to make them very quickly now. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have to have a DNA that is, subscribes to the values because everyone in the company needs to understand those values as they make those quick decisions. Mm. It's very different to the past where a few people at the top could make decisions. You just can't do that anymore. Mm. We have almost 20,000 employees very different, difficult for any group of two, three, four people to just make decisions. Yeah. You, so you're going to have the, the values, the cu culture has to be updated, and it's, the values have to be deeply ingrained in the team to make those decisions. C Camilo, when you started in the business, how did you know what the values were, and, and how do you now you know, live by those values? Yeah, I believe it's being in the second generation, probably in a bit of a unique situation. I know that my children will not be in the same situation. You grew up with these values so close to you. And uh, on that topic of the culture, I find it, uh, find it really, really interesting. And it's uh, growing up so close with an entrepreneur, you get the, the founder's mm. spirit and the, the entrepreneurial spirit is such a big part of the company. And that is something we value uh, highly and, and want to continue. And... Um, and we see that when we, we act with this combination of the entrepreneurial and very much uh, active ownership in combination with what we heard today, the, the scrutiny of the market, mm -hmm. that's when we actually see uh, results. But how to make sure that that uh, value uh, yeah. stays put is, um, I don't have the answer to that. Well, <laughs> you have the answer because entrepreneurs have good values because you wouldn't be able to work with a team <laughs> unless you had those good values. So the key is, how do you allow for those values to succeed? And in our company, we have a concept of intrapreneurship, which mm. is entrepreneurship in a big company. It is complex because we have something like 320 P&Ls. It is very difficult because you want to jump in one, and sometimes you want to say, do this, do that. But you really take the business and you split it up. And then those people that own those businesses have to subscribe to what an entrepreneur subscribes to, which is basically good values. Otherwise, you won't succeed when you start a company. Uh, Andre, you, um, you're fourth generation. So, you know, the DNA, I suppose, each generation from the, from the founder, from that entrepreneur, that entrepreneurial spirit, how does that sustain over such a long period of time? Or, or what then becomes the basis of the values? <clears throat> um, I, I think um, Stan's point was very, very important. Uh, values are intemporal. They, they, they can survive for a long term. You need to re, uh, to readapt them. You probably need to reinterpret them, but they shouldn't change very much. Uh, we've done an exercise in, in the third generation. Did that already before the fourth generation took over, uh, in a sort of uh, parallel process. You know, what does it? What does the family think and do, and what does the company think and do, and how can we? Um, plan this in parallel. So the company has now defined its values. Um, uh, we've written, we've captured them, written them down, three things, courage, integrity, passion. Uh, we want to, you know, we want to serve the, the patient. The patient is in, is in the middle. We're a patient-centric company. We're not there to just maximize short-term profit, as I said before. And uh, we, 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 we want to be surrounded by people who have these three uh, values and who are driving the business along this axis. For precisely the reasons that they gave us, you know, you cannot control 92,000 people. <coughs> if you don't think with the same way, in the same shape, then there is a danger of things going in the wrong direction. So, so Stan, when you look at, 
just finishing this issue of values, which I think is one of the most important is you know, points that's come out in the conversation up to now. You said before it doesn't really matter what the ownership structure is. Is there anything that you see family firms doing with regard to the creation and supporting of values over time that maybe a, a different sort of organisation could learn from? Or is there something specific about a family firm that, that is able to create values in a way that's different from a group of professional leaders? Actually, I don't. You don't think because so? Because I believe values yeah. are values. Yeah. And, you know, there's this whole talk now of stakeholders. And I subscribe, I, I, I bet you, if you go to the history of successful companies, they've always subscribed to the notion of stakeholder values. We call them the constituents, the five constituents that make up the mosaic of the Henry Schein success. You have to subscribe. If you're only interested in making money, you will not last. Mm -hmm. If you're only interested in your customers, you're just not going to make money. Mm. If... Uh, you, you are only interested in society. Well, we're not an NGO. <coughs> so I think, by the way, the difference between the two is in a public company, you have to have a board that subscribes to uh, an environment of purpose. Yeah. If your board doesn't subscribe to purpose, you will not succeed. Yeah. Families don't need a board to subscribe to purpose. They know themselves if they were committed to purpose. But, but, but I think at that, that point, it's particularly important. Mm. You do not run <laughs> a company for shareholders. You know, we, we do not own these businesses. These businesses serve the community, and, and they, they serve the community um, with a sense of purpose, with a good, clear definition of what they want to achieve. You do not go into business just to make money. You go into business because you want to achieve something, because you want to have an impact. And we don't say that often enough. You know, it, it, um, uh, as, as a representative of the shareholder uh, owning the, 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 our family company, I can tell you we do not run this company for our profit. We run it because we want it to be successful and to continue to be one of the leading pharmaceutical innovation company on the, in the planet. Andre, in your on world, you even have a higher obligation because you're in a certain part of healthcare where you're saving lives. Absolutely. You have products, and I've seen it with actually, we, we know a friend of ours, a life-saving product. Uh, Absolutely. You save somebody that we know because you had a trial of a product. So your mission is even higher than an average company. <coughs> we, 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 want, we don't want to be too specific. The, the, the mission of a corporation is, is, you know, is what it is in its context. But the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that you don't serve yourself by doing this. You serve yeah. the community, the stakeholder with whom you interact. Can, can I bring the voice of a CEO into this? And I want to bring the voice of Paul Polman, who I don't think is in the audience. But let him, let's imagine for a moment I'm Paul Polman. Um, you know, Paul, I, don't I think... I not have a badge anymore. But oh, sorry, that's another point. <laughs> he doesn't have one of these. Yeah, this is what happens to you, by sorry. the way. You just, yeah. Um, but actually, one of the things that I sort of found fascinating about Paul, and when I teach at London Business School, Paul has come in in you know, various ways, and he comes into INSEAD and so on. You know, he's been a great CEO when he ran Unilever about purpose. And I think all of us would agree that Paul Palmer was a CEO of a publicly quoted company who talked about purpose. However, when the share price at Unilever began to totter... And when the venture capital companies came in to buy Unilever, the fact that he was purposeful, purposely led, I don't think helped him that much. And I just want to say, Andre, is, it, is the reason that you're able <coughs> about purpose because of your ownership structure? I mean, uh, this is a little bit outside of the, de of the debate of Rolex or, or, or role model, but for me it is absolutely clear that Paul was able to see uh, the predators off because he reacted quickly into... A, in, I mean, the, the bid was taken out six hours after having been posed, put on the table. It, it caused him... A, but yeah, he I mean, had to is, change is, the whole structure of uni. I, what I'm, the sort of point I'm saying is, and, and maybe I don't know, Stan, what you feel about this, is that the ownership structure of a company really changes the way you're thinking about markets. And the sort of, you know, Paul was, would have been constantly looking at his share price. That would have been the first thing he did every single morning. And I think, you know, as a CEO, you're under enormous pressures from the markets in terms of how the market is seeing your company at any point in time, which would argue, by the way, for family ownerships. I'm going to make myself unpopular, but I think this is a very antiquated way to looking at how you run businesses. 
Okay. I don't think that just looking at the share price is, is, is something which is a guidance for the way you run a business. Might be a guidance for your retirement package, but not for, any, for much more than that. I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. The, the bottom line is whether you're a public company or you're a private company, you have to make strong business, hard business decisions. Yeah. And yeah. we have a restructuring periodically. Sure. We just went through one. And it's heartbreaking because we have to terminate certain people. But I would submit, if you're a family business and you don't do that, mm. you will not be a family business for long. Yeah. Because you'll go out of business. Mm. Yeah. And so you have to, it's identical principles. Mm. Yes, mm. Uh, maybe one quarter or two, if you're a family business, you'd make one decision slightly different. But you know what? If you have credibility with the public markets, you go to the public markets and say, this quarter, this is the problem. That next quarter, I want to invest in this particular project. And you know what? If you have credibility, you'll, you'll write it through. Maybe there'll be some uh, short-term play, but it, it could be 1% or 2 or 3%. But you won't destroy the company. At the end of the day, you've got to produce. It doesn't matter if you're in public or private. Camila, when you think about your own role as a second generation, um, how do you think about this point that, that both Stan and Andre have made, which is you have to actually run the company incredibly well. It, really, it doesn't really matter what the ownership structure is. I mean, Stan's your point was, at the end, you have to make hard business decisions. H how do you think mm -hmm. about that? No, and, and, uh, and I totally agree that that is uh, an, an incredibly important uh, part of it. And so when it comes to, to ownership, then, it's also about choosing the right people. Uh, you do want uh, the best people to, to run your company that you know can make those decisions. Uh, but I still mean that um, in able, in, in to, be, to be able to stay relevant tomorrow, to stay relevant to society, relevant to the consumers, you need to create value in a way that uh, not only maxim <coughs> maximizes value to the shareholders, but the society in total. I, uh, can sorry, I, uh, uh, we quoted Mike Tyson before. Maybe I can. I, I don't really know who said that, but there's a very important statement. You cannot be green. You cannot be looking after the world if you're in the red. Yeah. And the company that loses money just loses its credibility. Yeah. So yes, you do manage it for profit. Of course you do. Mm. But profit is not the driver. It's not the only reason you do it. Uh, positive cash flows in every endeavor, by the way. It's not only a question of business. You know, mm. Whatever subject you do, if you don't have a positive cash flow, you're running something that's unsustainable. And that's something we should not encourage. Even if you're an NGO, you still Even have to run like a business. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not going to yeah. be around. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've talked quite a bit about how family businesses um, have a great deal to say to the world about how you think about purpose and how you think about values. We've also touched on the second area that people really are interested when they think about family businesses, which is how do you think about the long term? And I wondered, you know, what are the mechanisms that you do that you use to think about the long term that corporations could learn from? Uh, you ask me. Yeah, Stan, okay. do you want to start? And then, so yeah. we have an interesting uh, 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 subcommittee of our board. It's not required by law by statute, and we have a strategic advisory committee. And it's interesting, this committee consists of three, or meets with three constituents. There are five independent directors that are completely independent as defined. There are managers that participate, and then we've picked five, and actually periodically we go to even further, younger managers who are likely to be the top managers in 15 years. Mm. They have a stake in this thing yeah. that I don't have. So the three come together and they work on projects together, thinking about, I don't want them to think about the future 15 years from now, but you know what happens is they come up with ideas and you say, wow, we can't wait 15 years for that. So it's a hybrid of directors, current senior managers, and future managers, senior managers. Yeah. And so I think you've got to have a mechanism like that where you really test yourself on whether you have the right strategies. The view of getting there may be different for, for both of you, uh, but you need to have people from outside and inside talking together about the future. Andre, do you want to? Uh, uh, you know, um, last year, 21 million people took our drugs. 
Um, the, 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 you know, we didn't cure them all, but we cured a certain amount. And, and, and I think it's, it's extremely important to create this constituency around you. But what it is all about is not this opposition between the privately owned uh, uh, purposeful company and the mm -hmm. stock exchange. Uh, we are humanity. We work together. Mm -hmm. Humans work together. And uh, uh, patients uh, will get drugs from where they, they need to get them according to the situation. So you cannot be just a... Um, uh, like, like the, the, the fat in the soil. <coughs> you have to be part of it and you have to be included in it. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, talking, talking internally, talking externally, ensuring that you are partnering. Uh, you've probably noticed that I'm wearing the Sustainable Development Goals uh, badge, uh, SDG 17. We will change the world only if we partner. And we believe in, in, in that, you know, of course you have intellectual properties issue, but that's not, that doesn't need to be in the way you can manage around that. Mm -hmm. But I completely agree with you, it's, it's about dialogue. So it's about bringing different stakeholder uh, views in who, who can talk about the future. It's about working together in terms of partnerships that are thinking about the future. Camila, how, how does your company think about the future? Yeah, I, um, I do believe uh, that, uh, it's, for example, it's not longer a matter of investing in sustainability or growth. Sustainability is growth. And uh, uh, our largest asset is a consumer goods company, company and we are <coughs> close to cons consumers. And of course, this is where we see the most growth. And uh, as mentioned before, uh, we cannot create value without being profitable. And we believe that sustainability is uh, profitable in the future. So we have actually, uh, just recently, last week, we uh, launched uh, our new strategy on sustainability in Kanika, our mm -hmm. uh, family investment company. We're implementing the SDGs as a part of our strategy, and uh, the companies will um, present results alongside their financial results mm -hmm. on this. And this is because, of course, we want to stay relevant and we want to be profitable tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I, it's the time of the, the day when I'd like to open up for conversations and, uh, and questions. Can, can I, uh, open, I open up to any questions that, or observations that you have? Yes. Do you want to say who you are as well? That would be helpful. Thank you. Mexico, um, we have a retail chain in Mexico. Um, I wanted to relate a little bit of uh, what you've been speaking to. What would you think, do you think about ex uh, family members in the executive team? Do you think this attributes, positive attributes, translate also there? Of course, they being prepared comparably. Or what have your families done about this? <laughs> That's a very complicated question, actually, isn't it? Um, should we... Do you want to, should we hear a few more questions or? As, as you wish. Or, do, do you, Stan, do you want to say, because you've seen yeah. both presumably. Well, I haven't seen as much family members, but I've seen members of our very senior team have their children in the business. I think it's a good idea, but for the children's sake, it's important that they are viewed as capable. And so you've got to be careful who they report to. Because if the, it is viewed that they are only doing what they're doing because of their relationship to another executive for their own self-esteem, it's terrible. Yeah. But we have had great success stories of senior management having their children in the business, reporting to a different part of the business, creating their own credibility. I fear that if you don't allow people to create their own credibility, it's bad for their self-esteem. Camille, you, you, you're, how do you feel about that? <coughs> no, it's... Uh it's a good point, and uh, um, I believe that also being the second generation, it's, it's, uh, it has been, in our case, more natural to be uh, more of a uh, present part of the company. Uh, I personally have been doing both, both working outside of the company and also uh, mm. on the inside. Mm. And um, I really value both. I value experience I got outside of the company, and I value also very highly the experience I have received on the inside. Um, when that being said, we have external management and, uh, and work with being active owners. But to be able to be as good as owners as we can be, it's extremely valuable to know how the business operates and what are the key factors of success for the company. Do you want to say anything about that, Andrew? Well, uh, two things. Uh, um, uh, uh, since the death of my grandfather, there's been no, nobody active in the, in the management of the company. And uh, so, so we recruited external managers so that there were non-family members. And, and we've, we've done very well with that. 
the second is just a question of statistics. You know, we have uh, uh, 92,000 employees. Uh, we have uh, 12 shareholders. The fact that one of the 12 is good enough for the 92,000, mm. it's unlikely. Yeah, it's a you really know, small it's, it's unlikely. And, 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 and creating protected yeah. markets like this is not yeah. a good idea. Yeah. So I, I, would, I would, you know, I would encourage people to find the right person for the for, for the job. David, do you do you have any views about that? Yeah, I, um, I don't know. There is a way of, of promoting it, of course, uh, or not promoting it. Uh, I don't know what, <coughs> but also um, there could be some um, positive attributes, long-term thinking, mm. as an executive that are also positive as we are talking about the shareholding now, mm. but there could be less agent principal yeah. dilemma, longer term thinking. Yeah. There are positive attributes, not only MBA thinking, but also longer term thinking in the committees inside the company, yeah. et cetera. I, I think, can, I mean, can I, can yeah. I say that? For, for me, it's really a question of ownership versus management. Mm. Um, without wanting to be rude to people who run companies, management is a more technical thing. Ownership is something where you really express your values, where you, where you really sort of, uh, the board oversees the company, the owners uh, oversee the ownership. And I think that, 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 that that's a very strong statement. I'm saying that because I can see that today we are confronted, and that's the theme of Davos this year, we are confronted with externalities which are much bigger than they've, than they've ever been. Mm. So we are saying to our children, you know, take over the company, but we cannot at all guarantee you that the company will still exist in the <coughs> years because of change in the environment, change into the setup of, of society as a whole. So the idea, you know, the, uh, keeping company relevant into the new world, talking about sustainability and sustainability values, strikes me as being a much more worthwhile job for the owner than it is, to the ma than it is for the management. Man management Delivery of, of, of targets is important. And you need to find the right people, as we said before. But the, the defense of the essence of the company, creating its model that is in relevance with the surroundings, especially when the surroundings are changing so quickly as they are now, that's the task for owners, in my view. You, you know, it's quite interesting looking at family businesses because any business, uh, part of what makes it successful is the way that it manages its, its succession practices. And that's even more important, I think, in a family firm. And it's interesting, when you see family firms together talking, uh, quite a lot of the conversation is about this, is about succession, it's about ownership. It's about if you have a large family, which member of those families should play a role? And these are very crucial questions, really. And as important as who is, you know, in Shell or BP, who's going to be the next CEO? These are fundamentally important questions to the long-term success of the company. One more, we have, I think, uh, time for one more question, yeah. Good evening and th thank you very much. My name is Ben Dal Khraif. I come from uh, Saudi Arabia, from a family business that's 65 years old, third generation. But at the same time, I'm also the uh, new minister of uh, industry and, uh, and mining in Saudi, just uh, four months now. So uh, I think uh, one of the things we should uh, learn, and I was hoping, uh, I think we discussed uh, part of it in the beginning, is how to learn from, from family business uh, the, the long-term view. In, in uh, both uh, industrial sector and mining, unless you have a long-term view, mm -hmm. it'll be very hard to, to sustain a business. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I see that uh, one of the uh, very important values of uh, family business is the long-term view. Mm -hmm. And the rationale behind that is people are looking at, uh, as we are all talking about the values, how we want to create, what we are trying to, to achieve as a purpose, but also we are caring about uh, uh, other generations to benefit and not just making the investment in our lifetime to... Uh, uh, probably today, if we think about it, I mean, when we think about the uh, stakeholder value versus the shareholders, it's, it's the design of the system that... Uh, unfortunately doesn't accommodate the shareholder value today our capital markets wherever you go uh, just focus on the quarter on on the, uh, on, on the yearly and on the annual on the share price that's the that's the dilemma and we need that's to change that we need to and that's precisely what we need exactly. to change. that's I mean, one of I mean, the reasons why we come to davos to make the world a better place exactly that's why I mean, we have chosen the theme of this year because that needs to change because it's driving us into the world but, but, uh, but i'm just conscious of our so no no i'm just conscious just, of our time because we're, we're, we're running into two oh, minutes i'm just finishing i mean yeah. 
I, I had to think twice whether to attend this or not because I'm no longer uh, mm -hmm. uh, presenting uh, family business, but uh, a government. But now I, I, I come to think about it. If if a government, uh, also officials, think about it, they will be able to do the change to really get the best out of the family business and uh, adapt it in the, in the uh, corporate world. Thank you so much. I, I just want to wrap up now, and I, I wanted just to say a, a couple of, of points which I think are just sort of fascinating, and thank you so much to all of our panellists. Uh, it seems to me that fundamentally what we've talked about today is values, and we've talked about, as you say, thinking about the long term. And Stan, the point that you made, which I thought was, you know, you've seen both, and I think what you're telling us is the practices of how you develop values and keep those values going and the practices of how you build long-term thinking are practices that every leader, every leader, independent of their ownership structure, should be considering. And in a way, we've been joined by two family members, and thank you so much for that, who have shown how their families do it. But I think for us, the overall view, which is a great view, is all of us can do this. It's about good leadership.